Please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own, with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Good morning, everyone. If you are our guests uh, here, you've probably had the honor of listening to Dr. Harp all weekend, and we certainly thank him very much for coming all the way to Castle Rock, Colorado, and doing a magnificent job. So thank you so much there, Dr. Harrop. Uh, if you're just traveling through and you have stopped by, thank you so much for being here. We are honored to have you. I have one quick announcement. If you have noticed over there with my family, we have a, a child with us. Uh, we do foster care, so we're doing some respite care this weekend. And so if you're wondering why we have a new baby in the Marion family, we're doing a little foster care. Uh, so we have uh, the baby with us until Wednesday. So if anybody was wondering why that was happening, um, that is the case uh, that is taking place. So you've probably heard of this idea of a bucket list, and this bucket list was very popular years ago where everybody had to come up with things that they wanted to accomplish in their lifetime. And so a lot of people would brainstorm and ponder, what do I really want to do with my life? What goals do I want to set for myself? Well, in the bucket list, you could write down, maybe I want to travel to Scotland. Maybe I want to go to England. Maybe I wanted to go back to school and get another degree. Maybe you wanted to climb all the 14ers or win your tennis league. Maybe it was to get married. Maybe it was to have kids. Maybe you wanted to have nice kids. But we all come up with our goals of what we want to accomplish in our life's times. And so we look at the bucket list. What do we want to do? What purpose do we have here in life? I want to talk about this idea of finding fulfillment in your life through one of the most depressing books of the Bible. I'm going to help you to find joy in your life through a very depressing text. You may be sitting back thinking, how am I going to find joy in the book of Ecclesiastes? If you read that book, Solomon just goes on this tirade of, it looks like it's a good day, but trust me, it's not. You may think you're happy, but what's the purpose of life? You may work, but what's the sense? It seems like everything he finds to do, he finds the negative in the scenario. And so how am I going to find joy for you in a book that just seems depressing? I think we're going to look at three ways that we can find joy as we continue our series on spiritual care of finding this pathway to joy in our heart. Let's look at the first one here as we read our text in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 9 to 15. Let's look at what Solomon says. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the busyness that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. That is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken away from it. God has done it so that the people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. So where is the joy in this text? The first way we can find joy in our life is to be thankful for work. Be thankful for work. 
In our society, we have created this mindset that we work all week so we can get to the weekend. We think that if we toil and labor all week, put up with our job, that we on the weekend can then have this idol called recreation. And so a lot of times we see it as a trade-off. If I work really hard, then I can have recreation. And so we have kind of exalted this idea of recreation so far that we have really missed the purpose of work and recreation. We think recreation is the true joy in our lives, and we want to sacrifice, we want to do the least amount of work possible so that we can maximize as much recreation and fun as possible. But Solomon looks at this, and he says, wait, you can find joy in your work. There is nothing wrong in liking your job. In fact, if you like your job, you're going to be a lot more content in your life. And so whatever you find your hands doing, whatever job you have, it is usually best to have the mindset that this is a good thing to do. This is a privilege. This is a gift from God. If we take the mindset that we work and toil and labor until we make it to the weekend, you are only delaying happiness until the weekend, until you get to go and do what you want to do. Then you get to be happy. But God is saying, find joy where you're at. Find joy in the work that you do. This is what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 3, 9 to 11. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the busyness that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. There's a lot of toil, there's a lot of work, and work is not where you go to the office, work could be in your house. It means that you have found a purpose that you're striving for, that you are taking the time to challenge yourself in a task. It may not be an easy task, but it's beautiful within its own time. It is a good thing to labor on behalf of somebody else or for some higher purpose. Because you don't know the end result of your actions. A lot of times it seems like we want to treat work like a prison. You go, you put up with it. But God is saying that you are making an impact through work. You don't know the impact you're making on your coworkers. You don't know the impact you're making for others. God knows the final result of the hard work that you have done in your life. You don't always know the mystery, but God has made it beautiful within its time. It reminds me of a friend that I have, and he could retire, and one day he was telling me that he doesn't find a ton of meaning in his work. He says, I work because it pays the bills. But I know my friend doesn't need to work. He could retire, live very comfortably. And so I asked him, I said, well, why do you keep working? Why do you keep waking up and going to the office and putting in the time? He says, Matthew, I work for one reason right now. I said, what was that? He says, so I can give to the local church. Because he wanted to invest in the kingdom that he was finding joy and purpose in his work so that he could invest in God's work. Now, there's no way that he's going to be able to see all that he has accomplished. 
But think about the resources that he is laboring for that he could reinvest in the kingdom of his Lord. You could see maybe someday when he arrives in heaven what his labor really meant. The second way to find joy in this life, to provide spiritual care, is to say yes to joy. To say yes to joy. It's interesting in this text as we look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 12 to 13. Look at what the author says. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that anyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his recreation, all his most rewarding moments, all of his rest time, all of his joyous, easy times. No, look at the word there. Take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. This is such an un-American mindset when it comes to where joy comes from. The author is saying, through the Holy Spirit, God is saying, take pleasure in your toil. He's saying, say yes to the purpose that God has for your life. I want you to open up your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim among you, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. This idea of saying yes is saying amen. This saying that what God has given you to do, the purpose that God has in your life, you have intentionally chosen to say yes to the joy that God has given you. The toil that you have, the striving that you have to do to make a living, to make life work, it's up to you to have the attitude of yes. Lord, what you have given me, I am thankful for. We usually like to gripe, complain, whine about work. But even in the Garden of Eden, they had work. Work is a good thing. It molds your character. It gives you something that is a challenge. Imagine if we had turned into people where every single day we wake up and do nothing. After a while, your brain would start to kind of diminish. Your muscles would start to kind of diminish. You would actually become weaker as a human being. Toil makes you stronger, and God has given this as a gift to you. So say yes to the joy. That is before you. Say yes to the struggles in your life. I remember years ago when my family and I, uh, the congregation was here, uh, was very gracious and gave us a sabbatical. So we went to Sanibel Island for a month. And since they wanted uh, like $250 for me to join the gym, I decided I could run for free on the island every morning. And it was fascinating because there was this old man and he would always be running and I would be running and he had this sign and the sign would say blessed. 
And the first time he was running down this road yelling, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Today's a blessing. Look at me. I am free. I'm free to live. Now, I tell you, the first few times I saw this, I was wondering if I should cross over on the other side. <laughs> I was thinking, I'm not sure about you, but maybe I need to run on the other side of the road. This seems a little crazy. But then I'd see him over and over again. And every time I realized this guy was so happy to be alive, I think he was retired and running. <laughs> And remember one day, he was running, I said, it's a great day, great day, I'm blessed, I'm freed. After a while, I loved seeing him. Every time I would be running, thinking, oh, I'm hot, I'm sweaty, the humidity in Santa Barbara Island is a little higher in Colorado, and I'm thinking, why am I running in 90 degree weather? And then you would see him, and I'd just kind of perk up because I'm blessed too. That should be the attitude that we have. We have been freed from sin. We are living for the Lord. We are in his church. We are surrounded by people who love us. We have jobs to work. We are blessed. We need to say yes to joy. Finally, the way to find spiritual joy in your life is to line up with God. To line up with God. Look what Ecclesiastes 3, 14 to 15 says. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. You may sit back and think, what purpose? What a reason do I have being here? But I think it goes back to our prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you really want to find joy in your life, there's countless things that you can do, but the best way to find true joy is to get yourself aligned with what God is doing. You will never sit back and think, oh, I served God again, I made a difference in his kingdom, oh, that was awful. I can't believe all these people's lives were changed. People were saved. Duh. That was miserable. But when we line ourselves up with God and we ask ourselves, what is his purpose? What does he want me to be doing? And then we ask ourselves, how can I be doing God's will in my life for Him? That's where the greatest sense of satisfaction and joy comes from. When you take your purpose, and when we think about our purpose, our bucket list, a lot of times our bucket lists are more about what we want. But I'm telling you this morning, the best bucket list is the bucket list that has God's purposes on top of it. When you sit back and think, how can I contribute to the kingdom? And you see God using you. You don't live in this accidental world. You live in a world that God has created. And so God has a plan. God has a purpose. And it's your job to find that purpose and to really sink into it, to really lean into that purpose. And when you do so, that's when you find true joy by making an impact for God and with God. I was reading this book by Adam Grant. And they did this survey with lifeguards, teenage lifeguards. 
And I kind of wish they would do this at the Butterfield pool, but they haven't yet. But these lifeguards, they wanted to look at two different groups. So they took 32 lifeguards, split them up in two separate groups. And one group was the personal benefit group. And then the second group was the meaningful group. So the personal benefit group, they took four stories. And in all those stories, it was about how lifeguarding benefited the individual. So it would mean how it helped them get a job, how it gave them extra skills, how it taught them responsibility. And because they were lifeguards, because of the certain skills, ended up kind of blessing themselves based on the lifeguarding experience. But then they had the meaningful group. And the meaningful group, they read four stories about how a lifeguard saved an individual. Then they measured what happened. The meaningful group signed up for 43% more hours than the personal benefit group. But then the manager was commissioned to watch, and now he didn't know which group was what. And then he watched, and 21% of the meaningful group did more helping activities, went the extra mile when it came to the job. But the personal benefit group, there was no visible results of any increase in their behavior. The key to finding spiritual joy is to not live life for yourself, but is to live life for God. That's where true joy comes from. People think joy comes from satisfying themselves because we live in a society that has become consumeristic of happiness. But God says true happiness is by pouring yourself out and serving others. Jesus Christ modeled that when he came to earth and died for our sins. He sacrificed for us true joy. He rose out of that water and we can follow him into the death, burial, and resurrection through baptism. If we will believe, confess, repent, be baptized from remission of our sins, rise up out of that water to newness of life, you can do so. If we can help you in any way, if we can be praying for you this week as well, why don't we do so as we stand and sing the invitation song. On bended knee I come.